that the, the advancement office has provided so that this remains respectable this evening. Okay. <laughs> so Todd Marshall was born in Buffalo, New York, and he grew up in Wichita, Kansas. The first member of his family to graduate from college, Todd studied English and philosophy at Siena Heights, what was then college. He earned an MFA from Eastern Washington University and graduated with his PhD from the University of Kansas. He has published three books of poetry, Dare Say in 2002, The Tangled Line 2009, and Bugle in 2014. Bugle was the recipient of the 2015 Washington State Book Award. He has also edited two anthologies of poetry and a collection of his interviews with contemporary poets. He enjoys backpacking and fishing and spends about a month every year in a tent. And I don't know if that's one month altogether or if that's over the course of the entire cumulative. Uh, maybe he'll explain that a bit in a bit. Um, Todd lives in, in Spokane, Washington, where he teaches at Gonzaga University. Go Zags. His work has been published in many places, including the Kenyan Review, the Iowa Review, Poetry Northwest, the American Poetry Review, Narrative, and many other magazines and journals. He was the 2015 recipient of the Humanities Washington Award for Leadership in the Arts and Humanities. And in 2016, Todd was appointed by Arts Washington, Humanities Washington, and Governor Jay Inslee to serve as Washington State's Poet Laureate. While a student at Siena, he played on the men's soccer team. In 2009, Todd returned to campus to receive the Outstanding Alumni Award at homecoming. Um, I came to Siena in 1984. Todd came in 1987. Um, I was quite a bit younger, quite a bit lighter, quite a bit darker hair, and, um, um, and not that much older than the students that I was teaching. And Todd was one of those, that those early days were fun. Um, well, the, the entire time was fun. Um, <laughs> Pat Hogan was my colleague in the, in the humanities division when I came, Sister Pat Hogan. Um, I think she was here for your entire time, um, six years overlap with me, and the two of us were the philosophy department. Um, and at this point, I want to correct a, a scurrilous rumor that's been floating about um, for actually decades. It, it popped up in some interview that was certainly, you know, apocryphal interview on the internet somewhere, that when Todd chose to pursue literature instead of philosophy, he was a double major, good in both, that purportedly one of his philosophy professors said something like, and this is how the story goes, like, you know, I thought you were good enough to do philosophy, or literature is, you know, philosophy light, or <laughs> philosophy for dummies, or something like that. I suspect the actual communication was something like, gosh, Todd, you are so good at both of these, this is philosophy's loss, but literature's gain. I suspect it was something like, like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, Todd um, um, got his PhD from the University of Kansas. They have a very good basketball team, the Jayhawks, and he's an avid, uh, rabid, avid, one of those two, <laughs> fan of the Jayhawks. I did my work at uh, Marquette University in Milwaukee. I went there the year after they had won the national tournament, now McGuire had retired. And there's a friendly competition between the two of us for, you know, Kansas versus Marquette. A number of years ago, they actually met during March Madness. Sadly for me, Marquette did not prevail. Several days later, here on campus arrives an anonymous letter with about 18 different clippings of the Kansas defeat of Marquette University. I still do not know to this day who sent those, okay? Um, so yeah, without further ado, because we're here to hear Todd instead of me, Todd Marshall. I, I think we can be confident that that this fake news, um, the story, and, and um, your reworking re of history. 
Oh, so I'm really glad to be here tonight. Thank, thank you to everyone for uh, coming out um, this evening. Um, I had a good day on campus uh, visiting all of the new buildings that have come up since I was here last and uh, spending a little time with students. I look forward to spending some more time with students uh, tomorrow. Uh, is the uh, volume okay? Are you good back there, Ellie? Are you sure? Okay. Um, turn up a little bit. I, I don't know how to do that. Okay, I'll just, I'll speak loudly. Are you warming up for heckling? Yeah. Um, so the, the title of my talk is A Chance to Make a Song. Uh, but before, before I share it with you, um, I'd like to thank um, Kate and her staff um, for bringing me here. Uh, I know that uh, events like this take a lot of work. Um, I uh, organized the Visiting Writer Series at Gonzaga for a number of years, and I, I know all the planning and logistics and such, and um, I really appreciate um, being hosted in such a great way. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Art and Mary for hosting me at their house, um, something that they've done many times over the last uh, several decades. Um, but um, I all, I'm always amazed um, by their loving care. Uh, my talk is in um, numbered parts, and I think that it's probably uh, polite for me to tell you how many numbers there are, because then as I progress, you can anticipate or uh, long for uh, the ending, um, uh, depending on uh, how you're feeling. Um, so I'll just jump in um, with uh, part one. I'm glad to be back among friends. I first came to Adrian in the fall of 1987. As I've said before, and as you may have read in various publications, I was dropped off in the parking lot by the field house with one, two, uh, the story changes, trash bags full of clothes and a school backpack that still reeked a little bit of pot and still spilled booze. The subsequent three years that I spent at Siena, the classes and soccer practice, practices, the social events, vivid conversations, social justice protests, and prayer vigils ended up being the longest continual home that I had experienced up to that point in my life. And the people, to name only a few, Pat Hogan, Mary Louise Hall, Patricia Schnapp, the sisters who shaped me, Mary Weber, Mark Shearston, Daryl Murphy, David Kalan, Dan McVeigh, the teachers that were both mentors and eventually my friends, and the pals with whom I spent productive and engaging, occasionally distracting um, days, Ellie, Teddy, Carrie, Dan, Drew, Beeks, Tim, and others, a loving community. I'm going to talk with you tonight about poetry, about bad rock music, about awesome hot rod Camaros, about service, and about how Sienna played a powerful role in transforming me from a dissolute and selfish young person into a person who tries not to be dissolute and selfish and mostly does an okay job. Simply, I'm going to share a few poems and a few thoughts about why this tiny college in the middle of farm fields is so special. Although the farm field vista dynamic has um, receded a little bit, I, um, you know, we can't quite see them as easily as when I was here. I am a first generation college student, and like many who face economic challenges, I didn't find myself initially headed toward a degree, a wonderful job at a great university like Gonzaga, and a life that's rich with questions and questioning. No, if you'd known me when I was 15 or 16, you'd probably have surmised and quickly that the odds were good that I would not graduate from high school, that I would end up in prison or worse, drugs, petty, crime, and self-centered, careless behavior propelled my life. Further, as we all know, economics and the accidents of lineage and circumstances can be oh so fickle. My parents both grew up in the housing projects in Buffalo, New York. When I was young, my mother, who, was in her, who later in her 40s earned both a BA and a master's degree, she gave me books and showed me the power of perseverance. My father gave me the fantastic freedom to dream. When I was young, he was always strumming on his guitar and trying to write songs of his own, always trying, trying, and conjuring and creating elaborate work plans, economic schemes made mostly out of conviction and words. Sometimes these dreams came true, mostly they did not. Among their five children can be found nine degrees. Each of their children have found reasonable success and stability. And yet, one branch over on the family tree, my uncle, my mother's brother, lost a daughter to meth and prison, lost a son to other addictions, lost grandchildren 
to various jeopardies. Similar dynamics describe the lives of my father's extended family. So how did my siblings and I avoid that end? How did I, in particular, avoid that outcome when I tried so hard not to do so? What happened? Well, I'll get to that in a moment, but first I have to talk about poetry, because talking about poetry is what I do all the time, um, and a specific poet whose work has haunted me for a while, too. I love memorizing poems and reciting poems. For example, um, the Song of Wandering Angus. I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing and moth white stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire aflame, but something rustled on the floor and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I'm old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among long dappled grass and pick till time and times are done, the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. That's an example of a poem by William Butler Yeats. Uh, it's from his early work. Uh, Yeats is an Irish poet who lived from 1865 uh, to 1939. And I hope you can hear its great sound texture, uh, the wonderful uh, rhyme pattern in it, and imagine the magical and mythical Ireland in which the poem finds its home, the greeny green green of Celtic tales and, uh, and, and from which uh, Yeats got so much creative sustenance. Um, uh, so concludes my wiki entry on Yeats. Um, but, but I, I want to share um, another Yeats poem that's a little bit different in its energies. Um, it's a later poem, a poem that he wrote um, just after the end of the um, First World War, and it's called Sailing to Byzantium. It's a little bit longer. Um, An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick unless it clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. O sages standing in God's holy fire as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the fire, purn in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal, it knows not what it is, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor awake, or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. Now, I jumped a stanza there to save a little time because the last image is the one that I really want to focus on because it's the one that irritates me um, so much. Um, I love this poem, uh, but the end has always bothered me because it's very typical of many poems from the modern period, many works of literature in general, and may sponsor many people's, especially young people's, negative attitudes about poetry or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium. Think about that vision of art and art's audience, that vision of poetry, literature, that vision about how art matters, about who matters. Three, let's take a break from Willie Yates and indulge me a few moments talking about a much, 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 much lesser poet. I've been thinking a lot about the places that I've lived and how they have shaped my life. Early images connected with upstate New York where I lived on the edges of the Adirondack Mountains, the oh so wide plains of Kansas, spindly scrub oak in winter, the huge looming cottonwoods loosing seed pods in summer, the high desert near Spokane, the wilderness and backcountry of the Pacific Northwest. I've also been thinking a lot about how, about how we first become connected with the arts with the humanities, with the desire to think about words that matter, the world that's opened through reading, an intoxicating place wherein it's possible to realize the importance of what I'll call an inner life, 
a life that feels the spiritual, senses great intensity of emotion, recognizes appropriate form and elegant shape, engages the intoxicating energies of the brain, perhaps even the soul. Think more about that world, about the holy hush of museums and libraries and classrooms, the splendor of stained glass windows, the dizzying puzzle of reading philosophy or theology, what Yeats, here he is again, um, calls the monuments of an aging intellect. Think about the first time you read a story or a poem, heard a speech or a song, and realized something about yourself, about others, saw a painting or a photograph, and felt something, heard a stirring piece of music, realized the stunning surface textures of a sculpture, noticed the elaborate dynamics of architecture, saw in the swirl and bold colors of a graffiti tag elements of design and composition. It's important to emphasize that those dizzy and sublime moments do not often happen without an initial entry into that world, an invitation, an initiation, without the tools, the resources, the skills, the fluencies that come with exposure and encouragement that too often are only accessible to very, very few. Four, which maybe brings us back to Yeats's poem, Later, after I'd been in college, I started to despise the vision of the arts at the end of sailing to Byzantium because of its assertion that the arts belong only to the educated, the wealthy, the lords and ladies who are the keepers of culture and are thus distant from less privileged lives. Let me try to be simple. A complete human life is one that has the ability to read, reading of literature, tax codes, great cookie recipes, voting guides, signposts, nutritional information, or the funny dialogue balloons in a comic. And more, to read a painting, read the hewn lines of a sculpture, read the various geometries of architecture and design. This reading stretches us, maybe makes us able to read the pain of others, to feel the weight and exuberance of others, to, see, to feel the weight of others' sadness and the exuberance of other people's dreams. Five, place is about much more than landscape, flora, and fauna. It is also about socioeconomics, what neighborhood you dwell in, how much money you or your parents have in the bank. As I mentioned, I grew up in Wichita, Kansas. I lived most of my childhood in a single wide mobile home, or I should say many of these trailers and apartments and rentals. We moved many, many times fleeing landlords and evictions. Our best family history, and I'm sure all of you know about the great fun of trying to construct a family history with siblings uh, many years after the fact, but our best family history, the amalgamation of the older siblings um, in the family's tales, says that we moved 20 times before I was 19, 20 times before I came to Siena. The situation was made even more challenging by the fact that I experienced the stigma of poverty in an unusual way because of my, of my ability to take standardized tests. Oh, the beloved ACT and SAT, the Iowa test of basic skills, GTC, all those abbreviated uh, uh, um, uh, names for the tests that students had to take. Because of my testing scores, most of my peers were wealthy and privileged. And as children sometimes can be, they were cruel, reminding me of our differences. And I want to say that I felt, felt that, acute, uh, that I acutely felt that ostracizing energy as a kid, but I'm probably lying. I can recall playing those times when things were okay, lost in the nearby, nearby fields, catching catfish and bluegill, occasional bass, sports at which I generally excelled, and books. But these also seem like escapes of sorts, moments when consciousness got so lost in the next action, the next someplace that wasn't the place where we were keeping our clothes. But then, always a re-entry into what actually was. Dad in some sort of trouble, mom dealing with it as best she could, stress, anxiety, what became a sort of tangible dread that led, in therapy terms, to hypervigilance toward parents, toward friends, toward the awful world that was probably going to just get worse. But those test scores, I was gifted, oh boy, Mainly what it seemed to do was to give classmates from stable and affluent socioeconomic backgrounds the chance to reinforce that actually I was white trash and didn't matter so much. They hung out with me but brutally teased because of the homemade clothes, the dirt, even if the gifted classes had us singing songs together in full 1970s splendor. Ah, those fake Petri dishes 
where they mixed all the smart kids together and pretended that the razor of class consciousness wouldn't nick any of us. Oh, did I forget to share some of the songs. This was the 1970s and performative learning, the cultivation of confidence and esteem were buzzwords and practicum. To be a winner at what you want, think positive. Yeah, believe in yourself. Think, tr keep trying, work hard. Visualize yourself being successful at what you want. Believe, yeah, believe in the creative power of the universe. Practice your talents. Be an individual to be a winner at what you want. Or, I feel more gifted on days when I've had eggs and bacon for breakfast. I feel more gifted on days when I surround myself with those who stimulate and nurture me. I feel less gifted when I isolate those from people who give me warmth. I can go on for a long time, but I'll stop. <laughs> Connie Bohannon Roberts, the first hyphenated name person I'd ever encountered in my life, uh, and I Googled her recently, and she's still doing child therapy work with puppets. She trotted us out on TV, had us sing our songs, and I remember that she gave me a toothbrush once. But it wasn't just a toothbrush, was it? It was a whole travel pack with soap and deodorant and floss. And what grade was I in? Fifth? How did I process that my teacher thought that I was unclean? Was it seventh grade when I first went to a dentist? Or did that come later? I remember as a sophomore in high school that they did the cleaning in two visits and the plaque coming off felt like a fish being scaled inside my mouth. Six. I had a couple of things going for me besides test scores. Although the trailer park that I lived in did not afford contact with the world of high culture, as I said, I read a lot. And I had a, a parent, particularly my mother, who took me to the library and brought me, bought me lots of secondhand books. The Great Brain series, The Hardy Boys, The Stand, and Tolkien, and many others. Sure, I was mainly reading from the works of Stephen King rather than of the tragedy of King Lear, but I was reading which means that I was already expanding my inner capacity to create imaginative worlds, possibilities, the stuff of which dreams are made and not deferred. This early reading, though, did not guarantee anything. As I told you, dysfunction courses like tainted sap through my family tree. My grandparents both died young from illnesses connected to bad life choices. My father's alcoholism plagued all of my childhood. So many cousins and uncles and aunts that I've already told you about. And of course, we weren't and aren't the only ones. My friend, the fiction writer Jess Walter, has a great line about our hometown of Spokane, a place of great economic struggle and poverty also, a place that um, has been described as, quote, a blue collar city with no industrial base. Um, Jess writes though, quote, on any given day in Spokane, Washington, there are more adult men per capita riding children's BMX bikes than in any other city in the world. And it's a pretty apt description of Spokane. If you ever get a chance to, to um, visit, um, uh, people ride the BMX bikes, of course, because they can't get driver's license in, uh, anymore. Um, uh, the, the meth and opioid uh, epidemics have ravaged a great deal of the population there. Uh, the line uh, from Jess is kind of funny, but it's really sad too. And for me, it sometimes um, feels like an unusual mirror. Because when I was 15 or 16, you probably have regarded me similarly. In Wichita, Kansas in 1984, I was that rider on a BMX bike. But instead of pedaling furiously to meet my dealer or maybe fleeing from family and authorities, I was roaring about in a car, blasting music from a stereo that I'd probably stolen. The odds were good that I would not graduate from high school. Uh, many of those with whom I hung out did not make it out of Wichita. The litany of the dead, friends, acquaintances, hookups, some past life is long. I spent several nights in jail. I was arrested many, many times. I snorted and smoked and shot up. I drank whatever was available. I did bad things. Simply, I was a reckless teen in the 80s, but there's kind of a beauty to this description in just a second. I had wonderful feathered hair. Um, and it was parted in the middle um, perfectly. Um, I, I always wanted to look like Leif Garrett, and if he's on your radar, I'm sorry. Um, but driving a souped up half junk 69 Camaro around the streets of town, grease perpetually under my nails, listening to big haired rock bands like Rush. Neil Peart just passed away, huge heartbreak. Um, bad ballads like Come Sail Away by Styx. Today's casino acts who play the same song 
ghosts that seem like tattered coats upon a stick when I see them on the billboards uh, advertising their performances. But I'm, I'm not here still uh, this evening to talk about bad rock, rock bands, if only for a little while, um, or casinos or four barrel carburetors, not even my checkered past. And so let me get to my point. I was a reckless menace who didn't care about much, didn't care that most of the things I did hurt myself and had a good chance, chance of hurting other people. So what happened? Well, I came here. Now some might be skeptical that the equation isn't that simple, but it's close. Soccer helped some, that is, I was always a skilled if smaller soccer player able to scamper about and sometimes make up for my lack of discipline as a player with reckless energy. And through a series of happenstance and intuitive sense, a longing, if you will, for the sublime, for the mysterious, for something more that lingered in the spaces created by the imagination, I chose to come here and I got very, very lucky. So-and-so met so-and-so who said to so-and-so, this guy could play for your soccer team. And one day I found myself in the parking lot of a Dominican liberal arts college in Michigan with a chance to reinvent myself. Seven, but it's never that simple. Here's the beginning of another Yeats poem. It's called Easter 1916. I have met them at close of day, coming with vivid faces from counter or desk among gray 18th century houses. I have passed with a nod of the head or polite meaningless words or have lingered a while and said polite meaningless words and thought before I had done of a mocking tale or a jibe to please a companion around the fire at the club, being certain that they and I but lived where motley is worn, all changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. You may have heard that poem before. Um, it's also by William Butler Yeats, and it's a poem of profound regret. And he regrets that he, treats, that he treated these men um, uh, who became the martyrs of the Easter Rising uh, in Ireland, um, a first movement toward revolution in that country. He treated them with just polite, meaningless words. And he throws out a challenge in that poem that I think is about as hard as any challenge I can think of. And that's the challenge of interacting with every beautiful God spark human being that we run into with more than just polite, meaningless words. The, uh, the challenge of trying to completely engage um, with, with those beautiful people in our lives. And he chastises himself ferociously for failing to do that, as we all fail to do that, but we can all try. The sisters at Siena, Dominican and otherwise, the teachers, my friends, the community at Siena met me with compassion and discipline, challenging me and urging me to find a new version of myself. They made me answerable as a better version of Todd. They treated, with, they treated me with more than polite, meaningless words. I don't know if that's exactly right, but that's how it feels to me as I look back after 30 plus years, many of which have found me paying my bills as a teacher. They cared for my brains, my talents. They asked me to memorize poems, sure, but they also urged me to find the words that mattered to just me, the songs that were for myself. And soon I started to see that the challenges of philosophy, the lessons of history, the difficulties of the social sciences that were part of my world. Soon I started to sense that poetry and literature, art and philosophy were golden birds that I too could admire, that I could perhaps urge and find a way to sing their songs. But more importantly, soon I started to care about myself. And once that happens, I was given the opportunity to care about others. Eight, which maybe leaves the question of how to deal with my past, how to make sense of those years before I came here. Well, shaking insecurities and coming to grips with my background has also allowed me to revisit it to go into the places to actually inhabit the where and when, the mutt metal brassiness of my impoverished youth, the trailer parks and violence, the dysfunction of an alcoholic household, the many violences rendered by and to me, the deep sadness that permeates so much of America, but especially those places where words are not fully under, uh, understood, where people do not have that access to a language that matters to them. This is a poem called Scars. 
Some trailers lost their skirting in the last storm, bearing an underworld of cinder blocks and flat tires, old hoses and leaky coils, busted bikes, millipedes and spiders gathering beneath the creaking of feet and beds, the occasional crash of a thrown beer bottle, shattered mirrors, or worse. My father nearly killed my mother in our kitchen, the Formica countertop broken at the corner where he brought down her head. Sometimes in sunlight the scar shines, skin smooth and tight, sometimes beneath moon and stars, sometimes a single dim bulb on the porch is enough. One humid night she opened the door to, my neighbor, to the neighbor's daughter who staggered in wearing cut off jeans and a black bra with one torn strap. My mother iced the girl's eye and the glowing through the window held them safe for a few sobbing minutes. Sometimes I was told to go find something to do and I actually played with the slow kid down the street. Even at eight, I sensed that he smiled too much and we chased each other around their single wide laughing and yelling until his mother came out and sharply said it was time for lunch, time for the boy up the street who a few weeks ago had shouted retard at her son to go home. Three years later, I cut through their yard to spend the night at Greg's, a 16 year old who held me down and said that I was going to feel what it was like to be a girl. I don't know the name of the kid who twirled in circles and fell to the ground giggling, who chased grasshoppers caught in the wind, always smiling, but I still know the heat from the flames after his place sparked, a cigarette his sleeping mother dropped between oily couch cushions. She ran outside and the door locked behind her. I also know that my father sprinted down the street and burnt his hands on each of the doorknobs, hurled a cinder block through the bedroom window and was held back by arriving firemen who saw that the aluminum siding was starting to melt. I know the woman's screams were louder than the shriek of tornado sirens, a cue that actually brought everyone out away from TVs to huddle together in the cement shelter at the center of all the cul-de-sacs and curvy streets near the communal swimming pool that was always closed or stinging with too much chlorine. Some old couples dragging coolers and lawn chairs down the steep stairs into the shelter. Most of us just impatiently standing around waiting for the storm to blow over, the wind to stop, waiting for whoever was in charge to say all clear, it's safe, you can go home. My poems explore Kandinsky and Crack, Box Goldberg variations and the numerous friends who never made it out of Wichita, the lives that never had enough lift from someone believing in them or enough opportunities to feel that magical energy. Here's another one. Never one to paint space, I paint air. Another jumper broken by the ground under the river bridge. Before the fall, did he consider water, choose to land on hard rock, intestines spread in bright coils of purple, red, and pink, or just fuck up and miss the chance for survival splash of the deep back eddy where buoyant washed up stuff like plastic bottles and traffic cones mosh for days. In the late 80, Robbie Brown told us he'd rather die than rot inside out of leukemia. We passed around a pipe, nodded, nervously laughed. Chemo, he lived. Kirk said, carpe freaking diem, I'd jump. And sure enough, outed by his mom, he did. And that, that, that poem's a sonnet. I was kind of um, uh, obsessed with writing sonnets for a while. Nine. On Monday night, I had the chance to gather with some old friends. Many of our stories were about wild times and silly behavior, but at the end of the evening, I realized that so many of the tales were also about service and sacrifice. Pat Hogan hauling Ellie Tunyon and me to a missile rocket protest, the opening of homes by so many people with generosity to people barely known, journeys to readings and lectures, homeless shelters, and the challenges of providing for serving others. I've tried to live up to those generous energies since leaving here, tried to offer the world more than polite, meaningless words, 
and more often than not, I've failed, but I've tried. And probably the best opportunity I was given to do that was through my service as Washington State Poet Laureate. Let me just tell you a few things about the position. It's an honor, of course, an appointment by the state's premier art and literary organizations signed off by the governor, but it's also a service position, an aspect of the job that I threw myself into with reckless abandon. Some days the role was very hard. I'm not an extroverted person, and sometimes all of the events made me feel wrung out like an old sponge. The travel was tough. I drove a lot and flew a lot. I, I drove literally 50,000 miles within the borders of the state of Washington. If you do the math on that, from my hometown of Spokane to Seattle, it's 280 miles. So it's like zing, 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 about uh, across the state. I also flew more than 20 times back and forth to Seattle and a few times down to Portland because flying to Portland made it easier to get to some of the southern cities uh, in the state. Um, I visited dozens of schools, retirement homes, colleges, universities, bars, libraries, prisons, bookstores, art galleries, and coffee shops. I led poetry hikes, poetry workshops, poetry readings, poetry slams, poetry salons, poetry happenings, and poetry protests. All told, I offered or participated in over 450 events in my 728 days as Poet Laureate. And one thing I always forget about is um, before I got the gig, I was scheduled to teach in Ireland. And so I spent 35 of those days in Ireland. Um, so it was actually under 700 days with that many events. I also wrote a dozen editorials for the state's largest newspapers, kept an online blog, uh, edited an anthology of Washington poets work and wrote thousands and thousands of emails. And probably the worst part about the jobs, I maintained an active Facebook and Twitter account. And so I had to be connected to both of those worlds. I list all of that as if it's a great litany of my labors, and I suppose um, I did accomplish some things. But to be honest, I feel a little sheepish sharing it with you tonight. Uh, when I think of a sister Pat Hogan or an Eileen Rice, um, well, uh, my lengthy list sounds less Herculean and more like a normal day. In fact, I can imagine one or both of the sister Pats saying to me, well, Todd, it sounds like all of that poet work kept you out of trouble. And she'd be right. And I constantly wish that I could do more. And it's because to engage the world with more than polite, meaningless words, we have to treat each, each interaction as a gift, a moment of grace, especially with the students, the children, encounters for me that were sometimes devastating and haunting. In Brewster or Bellingham, Seattle or Spokane, so many children, they bounce around the classrooms and smile and laugh. They look up eager and listen. I did my best to share words with them. We read poems together and looked at picture books and made metaphors and haiku and talked about reading and writing and how much wonder and imagination and living they had in front of them. But sometimes at an elementary school in Brewster, Washington, for example, a devastatingly impoverished town of migrant worker families or with an awkward seventh grader in Tacoma or Twisp, I'd see that one kid, sometimes a group of kids, over the course of a day, kids with tangled hair, a shirt stained or buttoned akimbo, teeth forever crooked. Parents, people who work with children, you know what I'm talking about. There, were always, there was always a kid who clamored a bit too much for attention, tried to sit on my lap when I'm reading Jack Perlutsky's The Dragons Are Singing Tonight, and I'd look to the teacher for help, and the teacher would quickly come and move the child away, giving me a knowing glance that says, here, there's such a long, sad story. Those kids who scarfed down any snack, that girl in Brewster who said, I hope we get nachos for lunch, but knew that she wouldn't get any. Those kids who slumped a little bit, but still had stars in their eyes, brilliant possibility beyond economics and demographics and the unfortunate challenges into which they were born. I know those kids. And sometimes that felt like too much. I know all too well the odds for those that are born into poverty, the challenges of parents with addictions, a parent on his or her own. I know that those situations don't often end with the opening of horizons, the gift of good luck that being able to bounce a soccer ball can sometimes provide. My name is Todd. None of the cool kids were ever named Todd. In the 80s, when I was growing up, they were always Kevin or Blake, Randy, or Ryan, 
Todd sounds like a box of dropped rocks. That was the simile we stitched together in Brewster, Washington, a group of fifth grade poets helping me. And when I was little, each day sometimes felt like a dropped rock plunked into a bucket sunk into a well. And yet my childhood was like the childhood of so many kids in our country, maybe like some of your childhoods, generations of familial abuse, abuse and addiction, frequent moves from rental to rental in the middle of the night, anxiety, and sometimes worse things, simply the stuff that kids contend with, learn to cope with, and hopefully survive. On those days when I saw all the potential of all those kids that might come to heartache or disappointment or worse, the smiles that haven't quite started to register the forces that are pitted against them, I wanted to plead with someone, something, bargain, if only I could give some of the luck that helped me, that saved me to some of those kids, because I would do that, but I can't. What I gave is my time and my fully committed energy, and I did so because I knew and know that there are things besides luck that, that can make a difference, maybe all the difference. Tim. I probably don't need to share the brutal facts of our historical moment, but I'm going to mention a few. History right now seems driven by greed and the perpetuation of pain. Not only is our level of unwelcome to neighbors and immigrants in a very crisis, the ways that our country articulates its artistic soul are seemingly under attack. The very existence of the NEA, NEH, that's the National Endowment for Arts and the National Endowment for the Han Humanities, and so many other organizations and outreach and education programs aimed at helping our most vulnerable are in jeopardy. The Department of Education is under the control who's, who, of someone who does not value learning. Why does all of this matter so much? Consider just a couple of statistics from UNICEF and the Department of Justice. 85% of all juveniles who interface with the juvenile court system are functionally illiterate. More than 60% of all prison inmates are functionally illiterate. The link between academic failure and delinquency, violence and crime is welded to reading failure. That's just one small sample of how, of how reading and countering words affects people's lives. I could go on and on. You can uh, research the materials on your own. I don't know the end game of the collision of these statistics and the barbarous policies of our moment, but to return to the children, those of you who spend time around kids at libraries, at schools, like I have been privileged to spend time around them for the last few years, you know what I'm talking about. The numerous children for whom just a little lift may be connected to a federal program, a little bump could make the huge difference between a dream realized and a dream that never happens or maybe even just the opportunity to eat a healthy lunch. Or from another slant, as Marilyn Robinson recently put it in a conversation with President Barack Obama, quote, fear is on my mind because I think that the basis of democracy is the willingness to assume well about other people. She goes on to connect that with the possibility of God. That sort of vision, that sort of empathy is hard, maybe impossible for some, but, but it's the willingness I once learned at this place, a willingness to open yourself to others, uh, to encounter people who are very, very different from you. And it's the sort of vision that demands incredible creativity of thinking and being. Sometimes, as I said, it seemed like I couldn't take one more frustrating moment of being unable to help those children and if I can't somehow find the magic or the luck to give each child a chance, then what is it all for? I know it's impossible thinking, but I also know that it's the only way that I'll ever feel as if the world is right. Remember Brewster, Washington that I mentioned? In Brewster, a very, very, very poor community, as I said, I met Jalisa, a tiny fifth grader who talked in the morning about how hungry she was, how she couldn't wait for lunch uh, she was the one who had uh, futilely hoped for nachos. Later in the day, we made poems together, similes for our names. Todd is like a box, a box of dropped rocks. And she said when it was her turn to, to share, I'm Jalisa, and my name sounds like three notes played on a silver flute. 
that was a mic drop moment for me, one of the best, best, um, best similes that I, I had encountered. A little more, Marilyn Robinson, 11, almost there, 12 is next, 11. A little more, Marilyn Robinson. She says, quote, well, I believe that people are images of God. There's no alternative that is theologically respectable to treating people in terms of that understanding. What can I say? It seems to me as if democracy is the logical, the inevitable consequences of this kind of religious humanism at its highest level, and it applies to everyone. It's the human image. It's not any loyalty or tradition or anything else. It's being human that enlists the respect, the love of God being implied in it. That's Marilyn Robinson. 12. Oh, let's remember Yates one last time. After the initial anger I felt towards his classism, uh, I've made my peace with Yeats. I'm sure that his lingering spirit can now rest easy and migrate on to its next incarnation. By realizing that I too had slipped into the same overly simple way of thinking I felt so critical of in his work. That is, I'd focused on sailing to Byzantium, forgetting that it wasn't the last note of his poetry. He too realized the limits of art with a capital A, an emphasis on the metaphysical, and hierarchical and classist vision of culture, and he remade his work again before he died. His last poems were from the, quote, rag and bone shop of the heart, and often included impoverished and marginalized figures from the countrysides of Ireland. I'd like to share one more poem with you. Um, it's, it's one of my own, and it offers another sort of golden uh, image. It's called Birthday Poem. It has a couple of factual errors in it um, because I've aged, but we can just pretend for a little while that they're true. Birthday poem. My mother turned 60 this week, deep in that stretch where anything can happen. Her mother died at 57. I'm 42 and Dante's dark forest, well, let's just say it continues to thicken. And I know what you spiritual people are thinking, muttering koans under your ginger tea breath. It can happen anytime, anywhere, to anyone, and that's why the moon doesn't cling as it slides across the sky. Fine. Last fall, hiking near Priest Lake, I came across a teenage boy covered with blood, sobbing. He held a compound bow with pulleys that looked like they could move the horizon, or at least hurl a razor-edged arrow a couple hundred feet through the breast and heart of a skinny doe and out again and into the shoulder of a five-month fawn that still quivered. Cedar scales covered the forest floor, a mossy quilt to hush the pain. And so we pulled on the shaft, but it was stuck in bone, and the fawn mewled, moaned, kicked thin legs, black hooves like chips of coal. I told the kid to find a big rock, quick. He did and held it toward me, somehow confused, and I tried to smash the skull, but missed once, shattering the eye socket and breaking the jaw before ending the pain and walking away among massive trees that held the sound in the harsh ridges of bark. Jesus, Mom, I'd meant to write a happy birthday poem. When I'd gone a hundred yards, the quiet beneath the looming cedars was the quiet I felt as a child in your arms. You are a little bit older than that kid. This is the best that I can do. Above the ancient grove, tamaracks lit the hillside in an explosive gold glowing toward dusk. Close your eyes. You can see them. Keep them closed. We'll all blow together and make a wish. And I had to add a footnote to my 12 sections. So here's my brief footnote. American poet Walt Whitman tells us that if we live fully, deeply, if we cultivate both our bodies and our spirits, if we re-examine all that we have been told and dismiss whatever insults our souls, if we treat one another with full attention and kindness, then our very flesh shall be great poems. We cannot know who we are or where we are, let alone what we are or what we can one day be if we are unable to read the words that are around us. We are best able to read the words that matter when we are actually surrounded by those who do stimulate and nurture us um, rather than being part of banal uh, rhymes. 
those who care for and challenge and love us. I encountered all of those energies here at Siena. I'll call them poetic energies and end by saying that I hope we can all make our lives into poems, that we can all be singing birds, if you will, maybe shaped of copper or wood, maybe wrought of fine brass, perhaps even of gold. The material matters little, only that each of us has the chance to play more than three notes on a silver flute, that each of us has a chance to make a song. Thank you. Ask me how tall I am. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, I, I'd like to know how you got to be an English philosophy major. What did you come to Siena thinking about? Well, philosophy was too hard for me. Okay. And, and so I, uh, I added on English. Um, I think, um, you know, to answer, answer um, uh, well, one, is this one not turned on? Oh, okay. Can I just talk loudly? Is that yeah, okay? Sure. Okay. So um, I always loved reading, and and uh, you know I think that's the natural start for becoming an English major. I loved words. I loved the rhythm of words. I loved the imaginative worlds that words could create. Um, and so the English major part um, was actually the more natural part. Um, when I started college, though, um, I thought philosophy. Um, would, would, would be the major that a smart person should do. And so I just, I, I, I embarked on it without even fully knowing um, what I was getting into. I took a graduate seminar uh, when I was a freshman, um, which was really stupid and really stupid of the administration to let me take that. Um, uh, and uh, it, it, instead of intimidating me, it intrigued me. And so I, ca I kept with philosophy. Um, you know, I think there's a great compliment there. Um, I think that they um, are both fields, um, as all the humanities are, um, that allow us um, to find out uh, what, mat what matters most as human beings. Um, uh, you know, what, 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 what we are bio biologically um, is, is certainly significant, and what, you know, what we're capable of achieving technologically is fine, but I don't think those um, uh, pursuits you know, give us insight into the human heart, the metaphorical human heart. What other answer can I shout? What do Here you we go. Yeah. You never knew me until when? You never knew me till tonight? Okay. Okay. So, Todd, I have a question because I remember once you sent me a poem to read, and it was about um, you were at the lake with Amy, and there was this whole, it was so real. Hmm. And I said, When did that happen? And you said, Oh, no, I just made it up. Yeah. So I was wondering, in the poems of yours that you read, especially the last one with the, the, deer, the fawn that yeah. was dying, how much is real? How much just comes in the writing of the poem? Yeah. Um, there's a, it's, it's always a balance. Um, you know, I think in, in, in that poem, the actual um, beating of the, the fawn to death was something that I made up. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the more... Um, you know, kind of personal story poems were poems you know that are, actually came out of, of, of my life but um, uh, you know that that one was one that I fudged a little bit on um, I think that that writers should give them the license to move in and out of reality I think that um, uh, you know poets who just write about their own lives personally I'd be writing mostly really really dull poems about my current life uh, uh, you know so and, and you can only write about um, your, your wild reckless um, uh, teenage years or your um, struggles and childhoods for so long, and so making up things and, and, and trying to imagine um, different lives, I think, is, is, is important. Fiction writers do it all the time, and we're fine with that, uh, but, but um, you know, it seems like in, in, in poetry, we, you know, we, we, we have this threshold of, uh, you know, did it actually happen? Um, oftentimes, uh, the stuff happened. Um, sometimes, um, it's made up, but the, the deer stuff was made up. Yeah. It's not so much like you shouldn't do it. It's that it becomes so real in yeah. the words yeah. that you just think, wow, this was really something. That's, that's the magic of words. Um, that, you know, can make, make worlds real for us. How many times as readers have we found ourselves 
you know, uh, sweating or, or, you know, trembling with, with nervousness about what was going to happen uh, in, in a, you know, this fictional cre uh, creation unfolding right before us. It's pretty cool. Great. Back here, Marshall. Yeah. Hello. Marshall. So, um, you hear me? Oh. So I just wanted to ask you, uh, listening to your speech, I know you had uh, fought through a lot of adversity growing up through your childhood. How has your childhood shaped you as a man? Wait, I'm gonna, so um, what, one adversity I have not been able to overcome is my hearing. I, 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 I have hearing aids and stuff, so I'm going to come closer to you so I can hear you for sure. Okay, so I said, um, I know as listening to your speech that you fought through a lot of adversity throughout your childhood. How has that like, developed you as a man today? Yeah, um, um, so uh, you know, I suppose it's something that you, you, you reckon with and deal with um, every day. Um, you know, I, I don't know that we ever um, fully get away uh, the, the, uh, from the people that we were um, as children. Um, they're always kind of bouncing around inside of us. Um, I mentioned that, that hypervigilance dynamic. Um, my friends will attest to um, what a nervous Nelly I am and how I can never make a decision because I'm terrified of making the wrong decision. That probably has roots in the nervous little kid that, um, you know, that I've written about in, in, in some of my poems. Now, I think, I think how um, uh, we learn to, to cope with it and to deal with it in ways that don't affect our present lives is probably the most important thing. And that happens through, um, I think, found, finding really um, productive, creative outlets. Um, uh, it happens through, um, for me, athletics. Um, you know, sport is still an amazing escape for me. It happens through um, you know, going into the outdoors um, where I can remind myself what a small speck I am in this huge uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 canvas that, that, you know, that is the world. Um, uh, and it happens by surrounding yourself with people who, let you, who make it so you feel comfortable um, uh, being who you are and knowing that you carry those scars around with you um, and, and, and being able to share um, you know, those facts with others and hearing about their own difficulties, I think, can strengthen each and every, every one of us. Does that help? Does that help? Okay. Thank you for your question. Todd, you shared at uh, dinner tonight that you have been in the world of education since age four, I think you said. Uh, since kindergarten. Since I have not had a break. And so yeah. I started kindergarten in four. So. And, and you've, <laughs> you've been in the, the world of higher education for, I'm thinking, roughly 35 years. I, so when, I, yeah, 85. Yeah. So how do you think that higher education has changed over those three and a half decades? Particularly, I'm interested in the classroom experience, you know, the teacher and the student. Yeah. Um, it's changed over the course of my, of my teaching life, um, and it's something that I'm not, I'm not um, navigating really well, I think, as a teacher. Um, I think that there's a profound difference between uh, the consciousness of those that um, grew up pre-cell pre phone, pre-screens, and those that have grown up with a screen constantly present in their lives. And I think that many of my very savvy colleagues are um, adjusting their classrooms in order to fit that change. Um, those of us that are rather are more bullheaded, um, uh, and, um, you know, and think that this is a, a blight, um, are, you know, aren't, aren't doing that um, as much. I think that um, reading assignments are definitely uh, not as long. Um, it seems that you know, I think classwork, seems, uh, you know, as I remember it from the early '90s, maybe it's not not as hefty. I think a lot of that has to do with intention spans, both the intention spans of instructors and teachers. I I, I can be wrong about this, but um, I, I, I think that, that all of us have a lot more difficult time concentrating and focusing on, on reading and, and immersing ourselves in text. I could not right now imagine the reading that I had to do for graduate school um, uh, um, PhD exams, where um, my, my great strategy was, I, don't, I guess I don't have a high enough surface here, we can pretend, um, what was one that you might know when you're really tired, if you sit on the edge of a counter and read, you can't fall asleep because if you fall asleep, you'll fall. And so it's a great strategy for staying awake. And that's what I did in graduate school when I had two little kids and you know, was trying to study. I don't think I could do that anymore. I think I'd give up much, much sooner. Um, and that's because my screens have sapped, sapped my attention span too. Um, so that Mark, that, come, that, the, 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 that comes quickly to mind. And I, and I know that's a little bit um, cliche to answer in the, you know, the screen dynamic in today, but I don't think we even have uh, the smallest um, notion. You know, Nicholas Carr has written really powerfully about it, but I don't think we have the smallest motion, notion of how it's affecting our brain chemistry and how it's, it's changing us as a species. Um, 
I think, I think mostly in a lot of negative ways. I'm gonna come closer to you so, so I can hear if you're getting ready to ask questions. Well, first of all, uh, you've had a pretty interesting life. And I wanted to know like, how do you process like, for example, dark times or joyful moments into your poetry? Like, how do you transform that? And also if you believe like, if pain leads to better poetry, like bad experiences lead to that? Like, how do I, how do I process experience into poetry? Yeah, how do you process like, yeah. bad times into that? Like, what's your process? Yeah, um, so I, 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 I journal. Uh, and so I have a little black marble notebook and I write down things in it that aren't in, in poetry, um, um, snippets of memory, um, little details. Uh, I don't usually sit down and burst out a poem. Um, it's usually, um, I'll have a little uh, paragraph or an image, um, that image of, um, um, of violence at the opening of that Scars poem was where that poem started in my, in, in my consciousness. And the next thing that came was um, living in a trailer park, the tornado shelter was always this place that we had to go to and hide in. And it was always this weird dynamic because everyone came in there and, it, and you know, everyone was crowded and gathered in there and tornadoes very rarely came. Um, but those two images kind of launched that poem. And sometimes when you get a hold of uh, uh, an image that haunts you, it can send, send you into a poem and you can get it done quickly. I have other poems that I've wor worked on for um, years that never really came to anything. I just keep fiddling out them. So the process is, is, is often really different. Um, the poet that I uh, shared a number of work from, uh, a number of works from William Butler Yeats, um, was a meticulous writer that would finish his lines before he moved on to the next lines in the poem. I um, mean, two days of work is a good day of work. Um, and then you can move on and progress through the poem. Um, that's not how my process works. So everyone needs to kind of find a route that's gonna work, work for them. Uh, my, my, my son, who's an aspiring writer, writes in huge bursts of writing. Um, he, write, he writes a lot of song lyrics and um, uh, you know, a lot of rhyming uh, pieces and, and he, his just come out in a burst and he doesn't like to revise very much, but um, he may change that process. Thank you, thank you. Anyone Does else? anyone else have questions? Okay, <laughs> well, there is a um, assortment of snacks out in the lobby and we would love you to join Todd out there where you can talk to him directly and thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for coming. Oh, here. I don't know if it was if it yeah, it's on. I can still hear it. Yeah, okay, it's, okay. Just, it's, it's just really quiet. Yeah, you just have to okay. really be talking into it. It's interesting. Okay. Saying with these. I thought it went very well.